Hello, my name is Trace. I'm from the state of Kansas within the United States. I would like to introduce to you this channel consisting of English with a subtitle. Little House in the Big Woods by Laura Elizabeth Ingalls Wilder 1867-1957 Chapter 12 The Wonderful Machine Next day, Pa cut the heads from several bundles of the oats and brought the clean, bright, yellow straws to Ma. She put them in a tub of water to soften them and keep them soft. Then she sat in the chair by the side of the tub and braided the straws. She took up several of them, knotted their ends together and began to braid. The straws were different lengths and when she came near to the end of one straw, she put a new long one from the tub in its place and went on braiding. She let the end of the braid fall back into the water and kept on braiding till she had many yards of braid. All her spare time for days, she was braiding straws. She made a fine, narrow, smooth braid using seven of the smaller straws. She used nine larger straws for a wider braid and made it notched all along the edges. And from the very largest straw, she made the widest braid of all. When all the straws were braided, she threaded a needle with strong white thread and beginning at the end of the braid, she sewed it round and round, holding the braid so it would lie flat after it was sewed. This made a little mat, and Ma said it was the top of the crown of a hat. Ma sewed hats for Mary and Laura of the finest and narrowest braid. For Pa and for herself, she made hats of the wider notch braid. That was Pa's Sunday hat. Then she made him two everyday hats of the coarser, widest braid. When she finished the hat, Ma set it on a board to dry, shaping it nicely as she did so, and when it dried, it stayed in the shape she gave it. Ma could make beautiful hats. Laura liked to watch her, and she learned how to braid the straw and made a little hat for Charlotte. The days were growing shorter, and the nights were cooler. One night, Jack Frost passed by, and in the morning, there were bright colours here and there among the green leaves of the big woods. Then all the leaves stopped being green. They were yellow and scarlet and crimson and golden and brown. Along the rail fence, the sumac held up its dark red cones of berries above the bright flame-coloured leaves. Acorns were falling from the oaks, and Laura and Mary made little acorn cups and saucers for the playhouses. Walnuts and hickory nuts were dropping to the ground in the big woods, and the squirrels were scampering busily everywhere, gathering their winter store of nuts and hiding them away in hollow trees. Laura and Mary went with Ma to gather walnuts and hickory nuts and hazelnuts. They spread them in the sun to dry, then they beat off the dried outer hulls and stored the nuts in the attic for winter. It was fun to gather the large round walnuts and the smaller hickory nuts and the little hazelnuts that grew in bunches on the bushes. The soft outer hulls of the walnuts were full of a brown juice that stained their hands, but the hazelnut hulls smelled good and tasted good too when Laura used her teeth to pry a nut loose. Everyone was busy now, for all the garden vegetables must be stored away. Laura and Mary helped, picking up the dusty potatoes after Pa had dug them from the ground and pulling the long yellow carrots and the round purple top turnips and they helped Ma cook the pumpkin for pumpkin pies. With the butcher knife, Ma cut the big orange coloured pumpkins into halves. She cleaned the seeds out of the centre and cut the pumpkin into long slices from which she pared the rind. Laura helped her cut the slices into cubes. Ma put the cubes into the big iron pot on the stove, poured in some water 
and then watch while the pumpkin slowly boiled down all day long. All the water and the juice must be boiled away and the pumpkin must never burn. The pumpkin was a thick, dark, good-smelling mass in the kettle. It did not boil like water, but bubbles came up in it and suddenly exploded, leaving holes that closed quickly. Every time a bubble exploded, the rich, hot pumpkin smell came out. Laura stood on a chair and watched the pumpkin for Ma, and stirred it with a wooden paddle. She held the paddle in both hands and stirred carefully, because if the pumpkin burned, there wouldn't be any pumpkin pies. For dinner they ate the stewed pumpkin with their bread. They made it into pretty shapes on their plates. It was a beautiful colour, and smoothed and moulded so prettily with their knives. Ma never allowed them to play with their food at the table. They must always eat nicely everything that was set before them, leaving nothing on their plates. But she did let them make the rich, brown, stewed pumpkin into pretty shapes before they ate it. Autumn was great fun. There was so much work to do, so many things to eat, so many new things to see. Laura was scampering and chatting like the squirrels from morning to night. One frosty morning, a machine came up the road. Four horses were pulling it, and two men were on it. The horses hauled it up into the field where Pa and Uncle Henry and Grandpa and Mr. Peterson had stacked their wheat. Two more men drove it after another, smaller machine. Pa called to Ma that the threshers had come. Then he hurried out to the field with his team. Laura and Mary asked Ma, and then they ran out to the field after him. They might watch if they were careful not to get in the way. Uncle Henry came riding up and tied his horse to a tree. Then he and Pa hitched all the other horses, eight of them, to the smaller machine. Eight horses were hitched to it and made it go. So this was an eight horsepower machine. A man sat on top of the horsepower, and when everything was ready, he clucked to the horses and they began to go. Their pulling made the tumbling rod keep rolling over, and the rod moved the machinery of the separator, which stood beside the stack of wheat. All this machinery made an enormous racket, rackety bang and clang, Laura and Mary held tight to each other's hand at the edge of the field and watched with all their eyes. They had never seen the machine before. They had never heard such a racket. Pa and Uncle Henry, on top of the wheat stack, were pitching bundles down onto a board. A man stood at the board and cut the bands of bundles and crowded the bundles one at a time into a hole at the end of the separator. The hole looked like a separator's mouth and it had long iron teeth. The teeth were chewing. They chewed the bundles and the separator swallowed them. Straw blew out at the separator's other end, and wheat poured out of its side. Two men were working fast, tramping the straw and building it into a stack. One man was working fast, stacking the pouring grain. The grains of wheat poured out of the separator into a half-bushel measure, and as fast as the measure filled, the man slipped an empty one in its place and emptied the full one into a sack. He had just time to empty it and slip it back under the sprout before the other measure ran over. All the men were working as fast as they possibly could, but the machine kept right up with them. Laura and Mary were so excited they could hardly breathe. They held hands tightly and stared. The separator swallowed the bundles, the golden straw blew out in a golden cloud, the wheat streamed golden brown out of the spout while the men hurried. Pa and Uncle Henry pitched bundles down as fast as they could, and chaff and dust blew over everything. Laura and Mary watched as long as they could. Then they ran back to the house to help Ma get dinner for all those men. A big kettle of cabbage and meat was boiling on the stove. A big pan of beans and a johnny cake were baking in the oven. Laura and Mary set the table for the threshers. They put on salt rising bread and butter, bowls of stewed pumpkin, pumpkin pies and dried berry pies and cookies and cheese and honey and pitchers of milk. 
Then Ma put on the boiled potatoes and cabbage and meat, the baked beans, the hot johnny cake and the baked hubbard squash and she poured the tea. At noon the threshers came into the table loaded with food but there was none too much for the threshers work hard and get very hungry. By the middle of the afternoon the machines had finished all the threshing and the men who owned them drove them back way into the big woods take with them the sacks of wheat that were their pay. They were going to the next place where neighbours had stacked their wheat and wanted the machines to thresh it. Pa was very tired that night, but he was happy. He said to Ma, It would have taken Henry and Peterson and Pa and me a couple of weeks to thresh as much grain with the flails as that machine threshed today. We wouldn't have got as much wheat either, and it would have been as clean. That machine's a great invention, he said. Other folks can stick to the old-fashioned ways if they want to, but I'm all for progress. It's a great age we're living in. As long as I raise wheat, I'm going to have a machine come and thresh it, if there's anywhere in the neighbourhood. He was too tired that night to talk to Laura, but Laura was proud of him. It was Pa who had got the other men to stack their wheat together and send for the threshing machine. It was a wonderful machine. Everybody was glad it had come.